Hi, I am Shizor Gursali, and I will present some results of a study about biotic interactions that we are conducting in GBIF data. So what is the motivation uh, behind this work? Uh, we started this work and tried to answer a simple question of uh, how people are sharing biotic interactions data. And we know there are many database information systems and data sets sharing biotic interactions, but probably the most preeminent resource is the global biotic interactions or Globi, with more than 13 million of records indexed from many different sources and formats, including interactions data in their record archives. But what you can say about the GBIF data? Since Globe is indexed interaction record from Darwin Core archives. What could we expect when analyze the occurrence data indexed by GBIF? We know there are many different ways to document biotic interactions using Darwin Core. Some of them are more intuitive, like the associated terms, uh, uh, associated tax, associated recruitments, and the resource relationship class. But some of them are not so intuitive, like the mesometer fact class, dynamic properties, habitat, and occurrence remarks and other remark fields. So we try to answer that question with another question that is can we use the same tools employed in Globy to extract interaction data from Darwin Core archives? In order to index interaction data, to create a pipeline, use open source tools to find, process, and validate data from the Arabic core archives. The pipelines make use of public request on instance to get all the Arabic core archives currently present in GBIF. They download the Arabic core archives are then processed using Elton to find biotic interactions, parsing data at several Darwin core terms. So it's the associated terms, the source relationship, habitat, opinions, remarks, and many others. Elton outputs a list of all interactions found, and uh, for each record, it defines a source and a target taxon, as well as an interaction type among other fields. Size the source and target taxon values are found by Elton may contain non or multiple taxon names. We use Global Names Finder to find the scientific names in both source and target fields. After that, we use NOMR to validate and resolve the names found by the any finder to produce an interaction list with normalized taxonomic names. So here is a diagram of the pipeline created for indexing biotic interactions. The final output is a file contain all biotic interactions with valid source and target taxon names and the interaction types mapped into the relations on Tolish. When available, the interaction score also include the geographic and temporal data. We have processed a total of 65,565 Darwin core archives, which includes more than 600 million of records. From the number, Elton found more than 10 million of records, about 1.6% of the total of the scanning records. The initial number of names in the source and target fields in the auto output is around 1 million. And after processing it, what uh, GNE finder and honor, we will end up with a bit more than half of the name being valid, around 3% of the names. The total number of interactions with resolved names, so the final output of the pipeline, was around 13 million of records. The final number of track records is greater than the initial number found by Elton, mostly because source and target fields with more than one A were split in multiple records containing power rise interactions. So here is a simple plot showing that we, when we look for the most used and urban cortex for commentary power interaction, we found that at least in the in GBIF data, the associated taxa term is the far the most used term. More than 9% of the interaction scores 
found or documented use that term. Curiously, the resource relationship class, which is now recommended by Garmin Core standard as the preferred way to document association, is less used than other non-intuitive approaches such as dynamic properties and the group parts. So it's not so common to use the source relationship to share sharing variety interactions. Uh, if we look to the definition of the associated taxa, it's explicit say about listing identifiers or names and the associations, but it's not often the case when we look for each contents in the analyze the core archives. So here are some examples of the values that we found. Uh, in spite of some data sets are using to uh, strictly follow the definitions, as we can see in the first example here, where we have a the interaction type or association type that's more genetic, then you have the names and here's a pipe to let us list the linear. Uh, but oh, many of the records contain data that is not trivial to interpret it by humans or machine. There are very little variants of values uh, here. When we look into the interaction types, we found that more than 72% of the reports include the generic type interaction with. Since Elton is mapping empty interaction types to the interacts with serving religion of college, we cannot assume that all the 72% are actual interactions. To be conservative, we can consider them then simple core together with the 12% of interaction type core with. So 85% of directions found are more like to be core and excluding has host, host off, and the if basically off, the other interaction types do not sum more than 1.4% of the records. It's really few, a few, few number of, uh, of the records. When you look into the kingdom classification of the record, we see that plants are the most abundant, followed followed by animals and fungi. And the other kingdoms like bacteria, archaea, and viruses, and cetera, do not sum more than 1%. So uh, what we see is that GBIF can be an important source of biotic interaction, but this data is not ready available and some cleaning and processing is needed in order to access it. Also, the lack of standardization and general guidelines on how documenting shared bar interactions have hampered the discovery and the aggregation of some data already being included in their import. Right? Although the explicit of uh, association term definition, the other associated terms, it has not been consistently used across data providers. Maybe a specific guide on how to use this term in the context of our interactions may help to overcome this. We have using this work automated process to extract our interactions, but do we to the main different ways that interactions or core points, if you like it, are being documented, it is difficult to assess the quality of the data extracted. Since JB focused on the recurrence data, the interaction or association are treated as some appendix data and do not have received too much attention at the moment. Finally, most because you cannot exactly determine the interaction type of the majority of the reports due to the lack of documentation of such information, 85% of records can only be considered as corpus being conservative, right? So we can we really improve that and bring the interactions of the center information being documented. We can look for answers in the GBIF grand and fine model being developed to expand the GBIF model uh, to be more in inclusive uh, and include a variety of uh, new use case beyond the recurrence data. I would like to thank you, the collaborators and all the institutions that support this work.
Thank you very much. Enjoy us at the biological interaction data in Chase School. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Jose. Um, Steve, how are we doing on time? Okay, great. So we have time for questions. Are there any questions? Did I miss someone? Oh, I'm trying to ah. Ah. Oh, yes. Thank you. I'm Ilya Gionu from Sofia University. Uh, uh, okay, uh, I agree, uh, fully agree that uh, it is a problem with the uh, not very well explained how to document, but have you any proposal about this? Uh, do you think it is a better way to, to do it? Because uh, in my opinion, usually uh, it is uh, sufficiently just to document the uh, interactions with uh, uh, two different on two different uh, fields. One of the fields uh, should be the type of interaction, and then the the, the second field uh, should be the uh, the interact uh, organism or something like this. Well, uh, thank you very much for your question. Uh, well, this is something that we have been discussing in the interactions, uh, bio biological interactions interest group. And uh, we have uh, talked about the minimum set of uh, descriptors or terms that we can <clears throat> use to describe and document uh, biological interactions. So there are uh, many uh, uh, discussion there about which are the minimal and uh, are you, very, you are much very welcome to join us in the interest group, and then uh, we can build this together. Of course, we have some uh, proposals to that, but it's not very consolidated because the the, the interest group has not finished its work. But we are uh, working a guide, or people uh, have more facilitate facilitate people to how to share species interaction data. Great, thank you, Jose. Um, in the interest of time, I think we should move on to the next talk, but there is a question in the chat from Deb Paul, if you wanna answer there in chat. Um, so our next presenter is Caitlin Thorne. Wow. Caitlin, do you wanna be helping? Yes, uh, we'll see. They want? Oh, hello. <laughs> okay. Are we ready? Shall I go? Yeah, let us wait till we yeah. get it in the Zoom, the, mm -hmm. the slides up in the Zoom. Now we can go. Okay. Hi there. My name is Caitlin Thorne, and I work at the Museum for Naturkunde in Berlin as a data manager. And as for my background, I previously studied and worked in geospatial technologies. So I have a special interest in GIS and georeferencing projects. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to be talking about a project I did, which was creating a method for georeferencing a historic collection. So what is georeferencing? Some of you, I guess, will already know, but for those who don't, when we talk about georeferencing in this context, we're actually talking about geocoding. We're talking about assigning coordinates based on a location description or address. But geocoding and georeferencing both relate to assigning a place and space, a reference system, 
which can be coordinates, addresses, postcodes, or something like that. We can also have reverse geocoding, where you do the opposite. So you take coordinates and you give it an address. So the problem we had in this project was we had a historic collection with quite vague place descriptions. For example, the location description of where the object was collected would only reference a town or a region. So it would say something like Berlin Mitte, which is just an area of Berlin, or it would just have the name of a small village. It wouldn't give an exact location of where something was collected. So we need to transform these vague locations into something more specific by assigning coordinates to them. There are a few reasons why we want to use coordinates. So they're standardized and they're easy to reference. They can be widely understood. And of course, most collection data standards request them. For example, Tedwig's Darwin course suggests including the latitude, the longitude, the datum, and the coordinate uncertainty in meters. So we want to give an exact coordinate with latitude and longitude, and then the uncertainty in meters, which is how far that coordinate could potentially be off from the exact location of the collection event. But we're dealing with old collections, so we can't just go back and ask a collector where exactly did you get this thing from. And we currently have no standardized method to transform these locations into something more meaningful. So the solution I came up with was to create a reference list of locations with coordinates and their uncertainty for all over Germany at different administrative levels. This collection was limited to Germany, so it made sense just to do this. Every administrative area in Germany would be assigned coordinates and an uncertainty measure. This created an output that is reusable for any other georeferencing projects within Germany. And it's easy for someone with a non-geographic background to understand, so the training on using it would be minimal. So here we have the different levels of administrative boundaries in Germany. We start with the biggest, which are the states. Then we move into the districts, cities, and neighborhoods. And then if we were to narrow these down even further, we'd get the specific X, Y coordinates. We also have a slightly different system in Berlin, so that's mentioned here too. And I started finding a polygon layer for each of these administrative levels. So the process for doing this project involved transforming the administrative boundaries. As you can see with this example of Berlin Mitte, we first create a minimum enclosing circle. This encompasses the entirety of the region. I then calculated the centroid or the middle point of that circle. And then I calculated the radius from the centroid to the minimum enclosing circle. So basically the centroid of the circle would become the X, Y coordinates that we'd use for that area. And then the radius would become the uncertainty. So this is the result we have. The centroid position is used as the latitude and longitude, the coordinates, and the radius becomes the uncertainty measure. This gives us specific reference coordinates for a location while accounting for the fact that the actual collection location could have been anywhere within the uncertainty radius area. Processing all of these administrative polygons together, we had an output table like this. This table is for the districts of Berlin. It provides the names of the different locations and their longitude and latitude. So again, that's based on the centroid and then the uncertainty radius in meters. And as for the datum, which is also important in referencing coordinates, everything was processed in WGS84. So this was done for all the administrative layers, as I showed you earlier. And these tables can be used to search for the relevant places that were noted in the collection data. Of course, there were a few challenges to this project. The first is that it still requires manual work. So after you get a completed table, a human still has to go through and match whatever was in the original collection to what they find in the output table. But I'm sure there would be a way to automate this in the future. And of course, there might be some areas missing that aren't found in the output table. 
That would require additional research for the person processing this information. But I also provided instructions on how to do this. And in the case of this project, most locations were covered by the output tables. Another issue is that, of course, borders change over time. This data was processed with 2021 administrative boundaries. So maybe Berlin Mitte is not the same Berlin Mitte as it used to be. <laughs> But I think it's essentially a safe estimate because of the large uncertainty radius, meaning a lot of area is included, which is also outside current boundaries. Another challenge was how exactly to create the centroids. It was decided these would be the centroid for the enclosing circle rather than the centroid of the polygon itself to simplify the uncertainty process. In the future, this system has a lot of potential. Something we could still do here is add a water layer in. So a lot of collections reference water body locations, especially in Germany, there are lots of things referencing lakes or rivers. Um, so processing this information would account for that as well. And another thing we could do is actually account for the historic boundaries by going back and basically repeating this process using polygon layers for different time periods. It's likely known when an object was collected, so this would create a kind of multi-dimensional resource. There is great potential for this to be used in any region of the world as well. So these are my references and my data sources. And if you want to get in touch regarding this project or anything geo-related or anything else, here are my details. Um, thank you for listening. Do we have any questions? Oh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, Arthur has a question, and I see one in the chat as well. So, thank you for that. This is um, it's interesting work, and it could feed into another project that we've been working on that we're developing on uh, a, net, uh, a global gazetteer of place names, etc. That John Majoric and several other people are working on. I was wondering if you've looked at the methodologies we've laid out in the georeferencing best practices. Yes, document. of course. That was uh, one of my references. Because some of those deal with the water and rivers and how you do those yep. and places like between two places and things like that or next to a, a hill and how you work those out. Yeah, I've definitely read all of those and they're a really good resource. So what I was specifically doing, I guess, was trying to create a way for a researcher to apply coordinates quite easily without having to go through all of that background. But yeah, I've definitely taken that background into account here. Great. Um, I think we still have a little bit of time that we'll probably take Siobhan. Oh, plenty of time. Okay. Okay. So Siobhan's question, she says, oh, OMG, I love this. Standardization <laughs> is fabulous. But what about historic places that no longer exist or have had their names changed or are now a different, uh, for example, size of town was smaller in 1800 compared to now? Oh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, it says answered in presentation. Where do we get the information <laughs> data for where the place is and the area of it in the past? Okay. So I haven't done the work on the areas in the past yet, but yeah, like I mentioned, we could, of course, build up a resource that does account for this because, yeah, places change, names change, everything changes. Um, so what I used specifically was open source polygon layers from ESRI and from the German government. And so I assume there would be historic versions of those as well. I'm not sure how far back they go at this point, but that is something to look into. But if those are available, we can definitely use that. There are also websites that have historic maps, so we could even start creating those base layers ourselves if we had to. It would be a longer process that way, but there are resources out there with older maps and things that we can use to create a historic reference as well. Great. Um, we have one more question mm -hmm. um, from VJ. He asked, how difficult will it be to process all GATAM, and I don't know what GATAM stands for, although I know that acronym layers, and make it available as .csv files, or have you already done it? What's GATAM? GATAM <laughs> <laughs> yeah, GATAM, I think it's, I don't know off the top of my head. 
I don't know what Ganem is, I'm sorry, but I, oh, okay. Well, in terms of how long it took though, um, it didn't take very long at all once I set up the process. So I did it, I showed you the kind of triangle pyramids of the different administrative levels. So the bigger ones, oh, sorry, the ones with bigger areas, the small, like the least amount of areas was only 12 but some of the layers had thousands and thousands of points. And so I processed them. I mean, once I figured out the process, I could do, I did all of them within a day or two. Um, so the processing time wasn't very long. It was just setting it up really. So yeah, it's definitely repeatable for other areas. Awesome, great. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. How do I get out of this? <laughs> And our next presentation will be by Roderick Page, and it's going to be a recording, so I'll get that started. Hi, I'm Ron Page, and this is a, a little presentation entitled Bootstrapping the Biodiversity Knowledge Graph. So if you're interested in this field, you've probably seen a diagram like this probably more times than you care to. This is the idea of a biodiversity knowledge graph. It's the idea that many of the things that we care about, publications, species, phylogeny, sequences, specimens, images, institutions, uh, could all be linked together. If we could do that, we could um, make some interesting discoveries and learn some interesting things about those entities. So this is a, a pretty diagram. I guess one question is, you know, how do you actually make this more than a diagram? How do we make this real? So what I want to do today is just talk about some work I've been doing to try and actually come up with a real actual biodiversity knowledge graph. And I'm going to run through the division for how this comes together, talk about some of the details, talk about some of the problems we encountered along the way, and then uh, finish with a, a sort of uh, a screenshot and a link. You can go and use this and explore this yourself. So the vision. So the idea is that one way to build this knowledge graph is to sort of copy what GBIF and also sites like Checklist Bank have done, which is the idea of have a centralized data aggregator, but in this case, for linked data. So the triple store, the thing at the heart of the knowledge graph is centralized, but the data provided by different sources, uh, that can be stored independently. For example, you could put it in a place like Figshield or Zenodo. So the data is still under people's control and could be updated, but you have a central place where it's all linked together. And furthermore, I'm talking about a single kind of knowledge graph, but the source code for this is open, so you could have your own knowledge graph. You're not committed to having this one particular uh, centralized knowledge graph. So just to give some, uh, some more details. So the idea is, first off, we get some, some IDF, the basic format for knowledge graphs. We get it from various different sources. I'll show you some of those in a moment. Each of these files can be stored somewhere. For example, like Zenodo, you can get a DOI. So that data set is citable. And the people who generated that data, you can cite it, you can manage it, you can update it, and so on. We then grab each of those individual data sets, put them into a triple store. You can have a centralized one on a, in the cloud somewhere. You can have one on your desktop if you like. And then at the end of the day, we want to sort of query that. And we'll talk briefly about some ways you can maybe get access to that information in the triple store. So the first point is that IDF is everywhere. Um, despite the fact we sort of struggle to make this biodiversity knowledge graph, if you look under the hood of data sets, uh, websites like ORCID, Catalog of Life, Zenodo, ICTN, Binomia, and so on, you'll often find IDF in the form of JSON-LD. And also, I think it's important to remember that we've been making IDF for well over a decade. So there are millions 
of records linked to LSIDs with taxonomic names. So we have a lot of RDF already kicking around. And there's a link on that slide to works out where I try and keep track of some of that. So the problem isn't really a lack of RDF. We have a lot of that already. Now, just to give you an example, this is some uh, JSON LD from ORCID, the website which uh, manages the identities for individual researchers. And this is a record. And what I've done is get a whole bunch of ORCID IDs for people working in taxonomy, uh, get the data from ORCID, I bundled that together, cleaned it up just a little bit, and put that onto Zenodo, and I have a DOI for that. So here's a chunk of IDF that people can reuse, and I'm going to use this as part of my knowledge graph. Now, there is a lot of IDF, but much of this IDF is slightly problematic. Um, and I refer to, refer to this as the dog feeding problem. So the, the idea, of course, the dog feeding problem is well known. It's the idea that you, if you make data, you should actually consume that data yourself. Um, otherwise, there's no incentive for you to make sure that data works. And it seems to a first approximation, nobody uses IDF because the people who pump it out um, in the vast majority of cases, it's broken. And if they're actually producing the idea for them themselves, using it and relying on it, this wouldn't happen. Um, and it seems to be sort of some data sets are better than others. For example, ORCID has problems. I guess a lot of this comes from the fact that their data is, is much as supplied by users. They don't particularly clean it up. And so you can't just go from ORCID to clean RDF. And just to give you an example of this, so this is um, a person's record, and you sort of come across things like this. So here's a DOI that clearly is not a DOI. It's basically two DOIs stuck together with a pipe symbol in the middle. This breaks any self-respecting IDF parser. So if you grab the data from ORCID and try and put it in a triple store, the triple store basically just blows up and gets very upset. And this is not uncommon. So one of the things, the practical things you have to do is take the data clean it and tweak it a bit before you can use it. The other problem is it's not just IDF that you want. You need a particular kind of IDF. You want data where people link different identifiers. Otherwise, all you're doing is taking your data and putting it into a format that most people don't like, and you're essentially just creating IDF silos. And I think this is one reason, for example, why LSIDs didn't work. So taxonomic databases don't tend to do this, but some sources such as uh, ORCID and uh, Plasi and Zenodo do this quite well. So for example, an ORCID profile has an ORCID ID and a DOI, and you can start to make links between things if you have multiple identifiers. In some cases, the existing providers aren't enough, and so what you need are data sets that I refer to as glue identifiers. These are just data sets that link things together. For example, the LSID for a species name and the DOI for the paper it's published in. So in order to make the knowledge graph coalesce, you often need to provide a bit of glue. The final question is once you've you know, beaten your idea into shape and added some glue as it comes together, is how do you query this? So traditionally, we make a triple store and we just give people a uh, uh, Sparkle interface. Sparkle is the query language that works for triple stores and knowledge graphs. And say, so here you go. And this is problematic because Sparkle is very powerful. Um, some of you who played with Wikidata's interface to Sparkle, you can do some really cool things with it. But it's not at all obvious how it works. And if you want to sort of promote you know, widespread use of this, I think we need something a bit simpler. So, can we query triple stores without using Sparkle? So one thing I've been playing with is uh, GraphQL, the graph query language, which is a complete misnomer because it's not a graph query language, but it is a relatively friendly way to query data. And the idea is you can use some very nice tools that tell you these are the kind of queries you can do, this is how to do them, and so on. So I've been interested in exploring using Dant as a way to make the triple store a bit friendlier to interact with. Okay, so we talked a bit about the sort of theory in the background. Um, here, I just want to sort of finish up by talking about the actual uh, living product. This is a screenshot from uh, 
an interface to this triple store. I'll give you a link um, at, at the end. This is, for example, showing uh, Terry Gristle's profile. So here's a taxonomist. Uh, we have data from ORCID combined with data from BioNames and Index of Organism Names uh, linked together with data from Zenodo. And so we can see we get a sort of profile of this person. We can know uh, how many papers they've published, uh, what taxonomic species they've described, and what images they've published. So by sort of combining all this data, we get a sense of what this person has been doing. We can also explore further links to um, where they work, where they got funding from, and so on. And you can then you look at other things. You look from the perspective of a, a taxonomic name, publication, an image, and so on. So we can start to sort of bring these things together in, I think, a useful, kind of interesting kind of way. So this is still very early days, but I guess the message I want to, want to give is that uh, there is a lot of RDF already out there. There are millions of triples related to biodiversity already there. We just have to go grab them, in a sense. Uh, one way to do this, I think, inspired very much by the kind of GBIF and checklist bank model, is that we get individual clumps of data that people collect or people publish. Um, we put those somewhere where they can be cited and updated and maintained. And that's one way forward. We then need to add some glue. Without the glue, we don't get the links. Um, some data sets are quite sticky in that sense. Others are still very much like silos. And if you want to see this live, there is a link. Um, I'll put this in the, the Slack channel for the conference. There's a link to the client where you can actually sort of browse through this knowledge graph as it exists at the moment. And look at um, species and publications and images and people and so on. And there's also code to the underlining toolkit. So with that, I'd like to say um, thank you very much for your time. Excellent. Thanks, Rod. I can see there is a question in the chat from Jort. He asks, how do you publish and cite your glue that defines the links between resources that you generated? And related, how do you allow others to inject their own opinionated glue to the mix? <clears throat> Great questions. I hope you can hear me. Um, so, so an example of the glue would be something that um, Nicole Carney alluded to in her talk. Um, you could have a data set that lists taxonomic names and DOIs of papers, and that would be glue, connects DOIs and say LSIDs taxa. That would be bundled into a data set, published say in Zenodo with a DOI. And that would be a glue data set. So we have a few of those, and that sort of helps provide the kind of links together. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we have a question in the Slack from Nikki Nicholson. Um, you've described a vision of a biodiversity knowledge graph. Whilst we're all well aware of the perspective that if you ask people what they wanted, they'd ask for a faster horse. How much community involvement drives the vision and ensures that it fits what users want and can meaning, meaningfully participate in? But, uh, that's a really good question. So I guess the way I'd answer that is there's, there's several approaches to this. One is somebody like me think this would be really cool to do this. Andy Paddles often does it. The other end of the scale, you have a community that kind of assembles and decides what they want to do. So I guess I would say on that spectrum, there's so Wikidata is at one end. I think if you want a kind of community-driven, engaged knowledge graph, that's Wikidata. And then if you want the kind of sort of, you know, just sort of somebody thinking about wouldn't it be cool to do this, that's kind of the sort of end of the spectrum that that, um, that my work is sitting on. So so the community involvement for me, I guess, is more directly responding to things like um, things that come out of working with biodiversity heritage library, that sort of thing. So I think there's a continuum about where you sit um, on that scale. Okay, great. All right. And it looks like we need to transition to our next presentation. So thank you so much, Rod. That was excellent. Um, our next presenter is Nathan Tarr, and he's going to be presenting live. So Nathan, are you ready to take it away? Uh, yes, I am. Can you hear me and see me okay? Yeah, I can, we can hear you. And um, we have the presentation, but it's not in presenter mode. It's still in like edit the slides mode. 
Well, my name is Nathan Tarr. I'm a oh, research scholar sorry. at North Carolina <laughs> State University. And so gap it. Oh, Going to end up playing your recording yourself. Yeah, I don't want to do that, but I don't know why it stopped. So I guess I'll just hope it doesn't start again. Okay. Um, but you can see the slides, correct, right? Yes, we can see the slides. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm Nathan Tarr. Um, I'm a research scholar at North Carolina State University, and uh, I'm going to talk today about um, our efforts to develop a framework for putting all this uh, species occurrence data sure. to use. And uh, oh, this is really annoying. I'm sorry. I, I don't know. If anybody knows exactly where to stop that. If you uncheck play narrations, yeah. That's it. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so anyway, um, yeah, I'm a research scholar at North Carolina State University, and we've been trying to figure out a way to incorporate species occurrence data into projects that we've been working on. Um, and we needed a framework for handling all the data in the ways that we um, need to do. And I'll talk a little more about that. Um, so we developed this framework. It's, it's a software-based framework, and it's named the Wildlife Wrangler. So I'm going to talk first about um, just really quick background on the main project that I work on, and then I'll talk a little bit more about the Wrangler. So uh, for the past few decades, I have um, been working on the Gap Analysis Project, which is, which is a U.S. Geological Survey project that goes back for decades. There's a terrestrial and an aquatic component. I work primarily on the terrestrial component. And the basic idea, if you're not familiar with it, is to map the distribution of species and overlay that with uh, the distribution of protected areas to uh, estimate how much of a species habitat is in protect various levels of protection. So this is uh, an example for a lark bunning based on 2001 data. We, um, we estimated that 2.6% uh, of the species habitat um, was in protection. So as far as the terrestrial gap um, species data, we, we sort of developed two different data sets that we um, intersect or combine. And so the final result um, in, the, in terms of the habitat distribution is, is a map like this one for the uh, Northern flying squirrel. And we use a deductive process um, to build habitat models where we reclassify land cover um, according to species, habitat affinities, and other parameters such as elevation. But um, those different, um, uh, that model is run within the constraints of what we call a known range map. And uh, so the next slide shows you for the same species what the known range map looks like. And it's basically meant just to delineate the areas coarsely where a species occurs within the lower 48. So I don't need to elaborate on this slide, but Obviously, there's an enormous amount of data available, and I just want to, you know, thank everybody at this meeting for all the hard work to get it available and accessible. And so we've been really, you know, focusing on how we can actually start to use this data for our projects. Um, because as I said before, we use a deductive process, it's basically based on um, expert opinion. And so the prospects of being able to move to a data-driven method is um, really important to us and exciting. So, um, so what we're trying to do is, is update our range data um, primarily first. Uh, we've also evaluated some models, some habitat models with the data, but this slide just shows um, the potential value of occurrence data. So for the wild turkey, it's uh, showing the, uh, the occurrence records as circles overlaid over the gap range map from 2001. And you can just see there are a lot of areas that could benefit from having um, incorporating that occurrence data. We could add areas of range. And so this next slide shows um, sort of where we're headed. I'm not gonna elaborate. There's a lot that goes into the, the range compilation process, um, but uh, this just sort of shows where we're headed, where we classify areas of the country as either um, occupied or not. So with, uh, so with starting to try to figure out how to use occurrence data, there's sort of two um, 
types of challenges. And so first is a, is a challenge of how can we use the data? Given the enormous amount, it's technically demanding to actually process it, but also we need to do that in a way that follows best practices. I'm sorry about this slide thing. Um, follows best practices for transparency, repeatability, and provenance. So we want people to know, um, you know, how we filter data and how we what we did to it, and be able to trace that back from the range data. So then the next type of uh, challenge is how should we handle the data, and this gets at issues of data quality and appropriateness, which can vary wildly, um, but you know, within the GBIF data set. Um, and so we got to sort that out and. I don't have time to elaborate, but two things we've spent a lot of time thinking about is how we treat records in terms of whether they're points or polygons and how to incorporate that into the processing. And then also the issue of taxon concepts and how that could be different than just names. And specifically, this can be an issue um, just related to the geographic component of a taxon concept, essentially the range. Um, those aren't all the, always explicit. And so we, um, we just try to be careful because the potential error would be um, adding areas inappropriately or missing records that we might want. So we needed a framework for documenting the workflows and decisions re regarding these issues. And we needed to ensure transparency and repeatability. And as I said, efficiency in the processing, but also efficiency in documenting our decisions because there's a lot that goes into that. So our solution was to write a repository of code that sort of formalizes the process and we wrote it in Python 3.6 as much as possible. We've been trying to put things into functions. Uh, we hope to do more of that in the future. Um, the user runs the code from a Jupyter Notebook document. It is written in Python, but it uses R for um, querying the eBird basic data set, which a user can download separately and defer to for bird data. Um, it uses SQLite for reading and writing output. And we wrote helper functions to help interact with the output to make it more useful. So the output for a query is a SQLite database, an HTML file, and if the user wants a shape file that's generated from the SQLite database. And um, basically the SQLite database contains a lot of the documentation and the records that are, are retained as well as the GBIF download DOI. And the HTML file is um, a documentation of the Jupyter Notebook, which has, um, you know, you can put text in uh, justifying decisions that you made for filtering. So uh, real quickly, just to put the Wrangler in context, um, as we've started to use the data for applications, I've, I've become to identify different steps. And the first is sort of making sense of taxonomy and making sure that you're querying the right names. Um, and just dealing with that. And I think for a lot of our species, it's not really an issue, but I'm, I'm afraid that if we don't, aren't careful. Two minutes. Two minutes, okay. There'll be issues. Uh, and uh, so the wildlife wrangler is really in this acquisition and filtering phase. It doesn't do any cleaning or quality assessment, but I could talk more about that um, if someone has questions, because we've, we've started to try to do that. So the structure is a little complex. Um, but basically, the, the code is all written into, uh, well, into Python functions, and then um, on this slide, the white boxes represent the stuff that the user interacts with, which is a query notebook, and, and then you run that, it, it runs the functions, and then it gets the data, and it produces the output, and the yellow arrows, uh, I just want to highlight that there's sort of an iterative process there where you run a query and, and the notebook actually gives you some data summaries and you can sort of assess if you're filtering out things, everything that you don't want. And if not, you can adjust your filter set and it saves the filter set as you do that. So it's iterative and you can reuse the filter set for other species as well. So um, real quickly, just to sort of, um, yeah, just to run through some of the, the key benefits, it's accessible. It's automated and efficient, it's repeatable, and it supports iteration, uh, provenance and transparency. We built in uh, aspatial filtering capabilities, but also you can um, query records from within custom polygons. Um, you can do that for the query, or you could as assign that to a species concept um, to sort of limit your risk of getting inappropriate records. It also drops duplicate or can drop duplicates uh, based on um, date and coordinate. 
and it approximates locational uncertainty according to the GBIF best practices, um, sort of interpreting the records based on if people followed the GBIF best practices for georeferencing. And so real quickly, just want to acknowledge, you know, all the folks that have helped me from USGS and, and a co-op unit, but also all the other folks that have written software and mobilized data um, that we are trying to use and, and finding useful. So the Wrangler has been approved um, by USGS and it's essentially a version one. So um, if you're interested, please, you know, take a look at it. It's on code.usgs.gov and please reach out to me if you have questions or you notice any issues or things that you think we should do differently. Um, I'm really curious what folks think about um, the processing. So um, please don't hesitate to contact me. And with that, I'll stop and take any questions. Great, thank you, Nathan. Um, any questions? I don't see any in the chat. Any questions from the room? Deb has a question. Hi, this is Deb Paul. I'm wondering about the future of the uncertainty data. You mentioned the point like radius versus polygon. Are we all, are we going all towards shape files in the future? Um, I don't know. Uh, I'll just try to use whatever, wherever it goes, you know, whatever kind of type of data um, folks put in there, we'll try to adapt and take advantage of. Um, I know that for some, there is like a field for a footprint, uh, which is well-known text, and the Wrangler uses that if it's available, but it generally is not. And so instead, we approximate um, the, GR, the, you know, the polygon with the point radius method. And so um, really, either one works. It's just a little problematic when, uh, when, when observers travel long distances, which is the case for eBird. Sometimes people travel like five miles. So a checklist or a record could have an uncertainty that's, um, you know, miles in radius. So um, yeah, we're just sort of trying to, I guess also just see what we get and uh, adapt to it. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, yep, that, um, so, that's great. Uh, thanks, Nathan. That's been really informative. Um, we are going to move to our next presenters, uh, which will be Christine Driller and Carlos Martinez, and they will be presenting live. So, Christine, take it away. can't hear you yet, Christine, if you're talking. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, now we can hear okay. you. Okay, sorry, but you also can see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, wonderful. I, I, um, didn't found the the micro button sorry <laughs> so um yes uh, thank you for letting us uh giving us the option to present um here one part of our biofit projects um so um today we will show how to find and uh, link data with two different um things uh first of all uh with the biodiversity with the Specialized Information Service Biodiversity Research, where Carlos and I are working for. And the second part will be about Scratch, but the platform with that you can also handle um, biodiversity data professionally. So first of all, I want to give a short introduction to um, BioFit. So we want to unlock data from legacy biodiversity literature that is almost an 
printed form available and different to access uh, because of that. With that, we want to promote long-term data series of species occurrences, or at least enable um, scientists to do this. And um, then we, uh, I want to show a short workflow. We are three project partners um, from the Senckenberg Society of um, Natural Research. Um, that is Carl and me. We are mainly working on ontologies. We are working together with the library um, that is mainly in, in Frankfurt and mainly um, responsible for the portal and the literature digitization. And we are working together with a text mining team or text technology lab that is mainly developing the tools with that we want to extract data from the text. So we, as you can see on the left side, we also try to implement as much as uh, uh, resources as possible that are available like from GBIF or Geo, GeoNames, but uh, we are also on to um, uh, improve our data extraction tools uh, by finding things that are mentioned uh, in the environment ontology or other ontologies that are available already and also well curated. And um, now I just want to show you a short glimpse of what our portal can do already. Um, here we are searching for um, Strelitzia Nicolai, it's a plant, and we do our semantic search and whether that you can find um, things uh, in, in context. Um, so we have um, matches on text and you can directly see in which context uh, this taxon um, is mentioned in the text. And this helps already much to find um, interesting parts that you're searching for. Um, the second thing is we try as best as possible to link the data with other um, data repositories or platforms like Wikipedia or GBIF. So you can also be redirected to these platforms. And um, you can also see here on the left side, you can have uh, different filter functions. Uh, it's about uh, authorships and years and databases that we are using. Um, so, but what if you, uh, we have, haven't implemented all organisms on the world already. Um, an update is coming soon, but um, we were focusing for this um, presentation for millipedes or myriapods, and um, we tried to find already something in our text corpus and uh, used our keyword search because um, the myriapods are not in our taxonomy backbone already, but we already found, uh, got some hits in our text corpus. So um, there is something that we can find and if people are searching for this that could be already interesting because it's becoming available soon in a better way um and with that already i will hand over to um my colleague Carl, who will present uh, the scratch Bits platform where he will show us uh, how to best um, curate uh, these kind of data that you got out of literature for example Thanks. Carlos? We cannot hear you. Yes, hello. Can you hear me now? Yes, at least me. Okay. Um, yeah, so we work with the Scratchpads virtual environment, and we basically aim at mobilizing data uh, from our portal and also from the literature into the Myriatrix environment. Next. And we chose this uh, relatively recent paper by Decker et al, which was based on uh, Myriapods from uh, greenhouses in Germany. And the first step for integrating a uh, reference or a source into uh, Scratchpads will be to record a bibliographic reference of that source. Uh, we use like the, the Biblio module. It has all the basic bibliographic information. Next. And then 
we are also able to add attachments, which can be visible from outside the platform or not, according to the settings, and also to tag bibliographic references with taxonomic names. So that's, that's a sample of the many taxonomic names that we added to that reference. Uh, next. One thing that I wanted to say is a useful feature that could be taken from pens of uh, taxon tagging, uh, like in this case, will be the list of taxa that is applied to each paper, but uh, that list is not fit for reuse and requires curation. So it will have uh, what I call trivial tagging like arthropoda. And what I'm showing here is that arthropoda is actually tagged from a journal name. So it's not an actual scientific name in the, in the text of the paper. So you have to look carefully and not just uh, copy that list from the um, taxon panel. Next. The process of integrating um, images from pens of journals is relatively straightforward. You can download the image and upload elsewhere. You only need to make sure that you apply the same CCBY license. And then you can, of course, add metadata to the, to the metadata um, fields of the image and um, part off with a DOI to have a proper reference. Next. There you can see the effect for one of the images and how the license is applied and the creator is attributed to the authors rather to the, than to the person who is uploading the image. Next. Uh, then uh, also sometimes the publications like in the biodiversity data journal, they have data sets and those data sets uh, are often occurrences, uh, but depending on the data set, it might not be fit for reuse either and might require curation. And that's also true if these data sets uh, include localities retrieved from the literature. But we still um, recorded uh, like the localities because Scratch has a locality content type. And we added the unique localities after the duplication to the Scratch Pass. Eight minutes. Next. Then it is also possible to add specimens if the specimen module is enabled. And at the bottom in the blue line, you can see how the specimens can receive the localities if they are already there. So it's, it's also a straightforward process, but depending again on the data set and for example, uh, the specimens need a catalog number. And sometimes that might not be in the data set because the specimens are not um, database yet. So in this case, for example, I had to create a SHIRP01 catalog number. And then I had to assume that the MIR was the collection uh, number, like for Miriapoda. And we know that Senkenberg in Gorlitz uses that one. Next. This is how it looks. Uh, so we tried to make more emphasis on one of the taxa. Uh, in this case, was Cylindrodesmus hirsutus. It's a tiny milliped which is spreading in hot houses in Europe. And the landing page, you can see how it has a part for nomenclature and also vernacular names. And then uh, for media, and the media from publications is also aggregated there. Next. Uh, the literature that can be retrieved uh, from a search in our portal, if you export it as a BIP text file, you can then import it into a scratch, but again, as a bib text file because scratch, but can read bib text files. And then you can create a curated list of taxonomic literature. Next. Uh, scratch, scratch, but has the taxon description content type. Uh, and as part of that uh, content type, one can create maps with uh, shapes or points from inside the platform but one can also display the GB occurrences. Next. It's time. And uh, basically we aggregated all this uh, information from the literature. So we have information on traits, in this case, size with the bibliographic references from many sources. Habitat information, next. And a lot of distribution information with many, many sources. More that can be seen there. Next. Uh, I wanted to say that this taxon description content type, what is underlying it is the species profile model that nowadays is, next, 
the description type GB vocabulary. So all this information can flow to GB. Next. And this is the Miratrix data set in GB. There are two references, one for the platform itself. I put it there. And then uh, to the right, there is a automatically generated one uh, by GB itself. Next. And here you can see from one species, it is not from that paper, but it's already imported to UBIF that there is distribution information exported along with the name. Next. And I wanted to show that because actually that distribution information was already cited in a paper in checklist this year. So it was already useful and gives some hope that we might be changing how data is published for helping researchers and research communities. So it was already useful to do this in Myriatrix. Next. Those are our references and our funders and partners. And thank you very much. If you have questions for us, we are available. Thank you, Carlos and Christine. That was great. Um, I I think we are close to being out of time, but we might have time for one question. If there's a question, I don't see one in the chat. Is there one in the room? Okay. All right. We'll move on to the last presentation, which will be Jeff Ower, and it will be um, a recording. So we'll need to get that going. Hi, I'm Jeff Orr, and today I want to talk about no-code and low-code applications, which could be potentially useful for helping mobilize data out of biodiversity informatics APIs. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with no-code, low-code architecture, it's an emerging paradigm in software development that enables users to use graphical user interfaces to develop applications instead of writing code. And this can empower people with less programming experience to use APIs and can enable fast development of complex data processing workflows, even if you are an experienced programmer. Um, some examples of no code, low code architecture that you might be familiar with are Airtable and the open source equivalent base row, um, which are no code relational database applications. Um, the tool that I want to talk about today is N8N which is a powerful workflow automation tool. Um, and to use the tool, you basically add nodes to the project. And the most common type of node project is an API wrapper. So for example, if you wanted to pull data out of Taxon Works, you would hit this button and add the Taxon Works node. And then the nodes can perform processing and then they basically return output. So you could, for example, um, filter for scientific names out of a TaxonWorks project and then wire that output to another node, um, which allows you to integrate multiple services together. Um, once you've developed a workflow and saved it, you can trigger it manually or automatically through a variety of ways. Um, there's over 220 node integrations currently available, ramping a lot of the popular internet APIs. Uh, including uh, Google Sheets, Twitter, Airtable. Um, so I want to show a quick demo of a workflow. And basically to execute a saved workflow manually, you just hit the execute workflow button. This workflow is designed to uh, use scientific names from Taxon Works to query barcode of life to get DNA sequences. Um, which are then reformatted and merged together with um, the Taxon Works records, and then reformatted to an import format for Taxon Works. Um, and then in the final step, you can basically download the names from Taxon Works with the barcode sequences as a spreadsheet. 
And then you'd be able to import that spreadsheet into TaxonWorks. So just looking more specifically at how these nodes work, if we look at the bold node, you can see the input data coming from TaxonWorks with the scientific names in the cached column. Um, and in order to query bold, we're picking the um, combined specimen and sequence um, API endpoint and um, getting those resources. And then to set up the search query, you can basically just drag and drop in the scientific name. I'm not going to do it since it's already hooked up. But then basically when the node executes, it's going to go through each row and query the barcode of life service. And if there's a record, it will return output. Um, so these first two scientific names didn't have output. So these two are empty. But if you scroll down for this third one, you can see a DNA sequence here. So to give you an idea of some of the more generic nodes that are available in addition to uh, the 220 integrations that wrap um, internet APIs, um, these more generic nodes are useful for building um, a wide variety of potential automation workflows. Uh, so once you've saved your workflow, you can trigger them through a variety of ways, manually at a set time interval, at a specific time with a cron job, um, with an internet push request, or like if a file changes on your system, you can trigger a workflow based on that. And then you can trigger workflows with other workflows. If you had an error, you can trigger a workflow, um, which would be useful for sending email notifications that your long running job failed. Um, and then N8N trigger allows you to um, control N8N. So basically at the start of N8N, you can run workflows. There's also a lot of uh, different data sources that you can use. If you have a local PDF file that you want to pull data from, you can use the read PDF node. There's a spreadsheet node that lets you read or write spreadsheet files. Um, you can compress and unzip files or work with binary files like images. Um, and then also you can connect to local or remote databases like MySQL or Postgres. Then once you have the data in, um, there's a variety of nodes for data manipulation. One of the most useful and powerful node types is the function type, which allows you to write small snippets of JavaScript code. Um, often you use these to reformat data. If you have like some more simple changes that you need to make to data, like renaming keys, you can use this node. Or if you wanted to set a key on a JSON object, you can use set. So for data flow, you might want to merge two inputs together like we had in the demo, merging input from TaxonWorks and input from Barcode of Life into a single output. Um, you could also do a conditional data flow where if the condition is true, it will run this branch of your workflow. And if it's false, it'll run this branch. Or if you have more than one condition, you could use a switch. Um, there's splitting in batches, waiting, and then stopping an error, which could work in combination with the error workflows. A lot of internet services still don't have APIs written in N8N, and in that case, you can use the HTTP request node um, and basically look at the API docu documentation and figure out what request you need to send to interact with that service. And then a lot of websites don't have APIs at all. So in that case, you could use the HTTP request node with HTML extract to still scrape data off of those websites. And then for power users, there's also like the ability to execute local commands or use SSH to execute remote commands. You can also interact with Git. Um, so for like the last several months, I've been working on the biology node to node project and I've been developing API wrappers for um, biodiversity informatics APIs so that we can use any and for workflow automation. And so far, I've got um, 12 projects mostly covered, although some 
Uh, there's still definitely more work to be done on Checklist Bank, which has a really big API. Um, so that one's basically read, write only and focused on data sets instead of projects so far. Um, but I'm planning on also trying to add in a Checklist Bank project node. If you have a service that isn't covered yet uh, and want to have a wrapper developed for it, you can open a GitHub issue ticket, and I'd be happy to um, try to develop one. Two minutes. So here's some other potential example workflows. Um, this one's kind of similar to the barcode of life example, except in this example, it's um, taking names, scientific names from taxon works and using it to query Wikidata for external identifiers from a variety of services and then reformatting them into the import format for taxon works. And this could potentially enable doing future work because once you have the external identifiers for these services, you could then query those APIs for additional data or just directly link from taxon works to these other services so that you can quickly look at data about the species or taxon. Um, in this example, it will send email notifications if a new species is added to a genus of interest in Catalog of Life. Um, using the name usage endpoint of Catalog of Life, it searches for species within the genus and reformats them. And then you also have a list of species that you already know about in a Google Sheet. So we use the merge node to figure out which records are new um, when comparing the two inputs. And if it finds new ones, it sends an email notification using the Gmail node. And then also it saves those new names to Google Sheets so that you don't get duplicate emails. And then this one can be run on whatever time interval you want. Um, in this example, it's um, searching for scientific, it's searching for the word species mentioned in Twitter, and then sending those tweets to the global names GN Finder tool to search for scientific names within the tweet. And if it finds any, it reformats them and saves it to a Google Sheet so that you can basically monitor social media for what the most popular mentioned species are. If you would like to learn more about the Biology Node Node project, please visit the GitHub um, site. And then if you have any questions, please feel free to get in touch with me. Um, I'm really thankful to the N8N team and community for developing the environment that this work depends on. And then also with the Biodiversity Informatics API developers and my collaborators at Species File Group. With that, I'd uh, like to take any questions. Um, and thank you for coming to my talk. That was great, Jeff. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. I don't see any on the chat. Are there any? Oh, there's a question in the room. Good afternoon. I am AJ Sain from Labor Cherry. And the point with this specific tool is um, have you tested or just going to a lawyer about the specific license you have used because it's not a standard one so trying to collaborate or trying to extend that uh, elements and uh, provide new capabilities and integrate it with them uh, is not covered by, by standard licenses so you are it's completely isolated so how do you f feel that can you manage that Um, I was planning on basically <laughs> contributing these nodes back upstream. I, and it is licensed under fair code, um, uh, which is a different license. But, well, I guess I need to look into this more. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Um, there's a question in the chat from Deb Paul. How do we learn to use... I don't, N-A-8-N, <laughs> and your bio N2N tool, where do we start? 
Um, there is like a bunch of resources on N8N, uh, including like they've developed courses. Um, and so basically there's two courses on there that help teach how to use the tool. It is a low code app, but I think it's still very much geared towards newer programmers. So it's basically a pretty friendly community. So there's like forums and stuff that you can interact with. And then also, if you have any questions, I'd also be happy to help you out. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Um, any other questions? No. OK. Well, thank you, everyone, for a great session. Um, maybe a round of applause for all the speakers. And uh, I just wanted to say thank you to the technical team here who's been keeping everything running. So thank you. And we'll see everyone tomorrow. Our computer just died.